The title of my talk is Hiring is Hard, Growing the Site Reliability Team at LinkedIn. And I know it's in the opposite order on the slides, but as I was just thinking about it right now, I think it makes more sense to change the order of those things. Uh, hiring is hard. Hiring is hard for this kind of role, for site reliability engineers, DevOps, asterisk ops, sysadmins, whatever you call them at your workplace. Uh, the, these kind of people are difficult to find. And then once you have them, you need to screen them, and you need to get them to stay. And all of those things are difficult. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about why that is hard, how to make it be less hard, and how to know that you are actually working and how you're actually getting things to be productive. Yes? Could you uh, reposition your mic? We're having a hard time hearing Oh, I can. Is this any better? Can you guys hear in the back? Hello? Yes? Ah, sound guy's coming. So I'll scream for a bit. Oh, no, that works. Uh, so I work for LinkedIn. I am a manager of the site reliability team. I work out of our New York office. It's a remote office. It's a small engineering presence compared to our headquarters, which is down the street in Mountain View. Uh, I have a master's in industrial or organizational psychology. If you are asking what that is, welcome to the club. Literally, no one knows what that is except for one person back there. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I will talk a little bit later about why she applauded, because it is a cool thing. It's something that we really need in the industry. Uh, and I'll talk about why that makes me qualified to give you advice. I am responsible for LinkedIn's SRE interview process. I took on this responsibility just as a regular old IC. I thought, saw the process, thought I could use some help, and volunteered. And then the company was like, oh, somebody wants to do some extra work? Go for it. Knock it out. Uh, so I took that in. It started up from the bottom up. It was something that wasn't a top-down thing of we need to change our process. It was just I identified some problems, and we worked to fix those. Uh, another thing that helps me have a little bit more credibility, I think, is that our team has grown a lot. So in less than three years, we grew 10x. We've actually grown even more than that since I prepared the slides. It's now closer to 11 and a half times. Uh, we have had exponential growth in SREs. It's just we get them all the time. So who are SREs at LinkedIn? Well, there are over 100 of us. We have five sites, two countries. There are over 1,000 software engineers that we support. And we are the eighth busiest website in the world. So the point of all these stats is not to tell you, you know, anything about LinkedIn's architecture. It's more just to say, this is a big deal. Right? We have people that require significant technical skill. It is hard to find people that can operate at this level of scale or that have experience at this level of scale. We have over 10,000 production machines per each data center. We currently have two. We are in the middle of, as we speak today, building another data center out that will go live this year. So we'll have over 30,000 production machines, not counting our offline grid, our administration boxes, all that sort of stuff, which are probably another 15, 20,000. So each SRE is responsible, if you do the math, for at least 500 machines, probably more than that. Uh, and it's something that requires a very technical, a very savvy kind of person. We operate over 300 RESTful services. We have over 300 million members. We have services that have 99th percentile latencies as low as 10 milliseconds. Uh, again, it's kind of a big deal to work at LinkedIn. It's kind of impressive to be able to handle this kind of stuff. And it's things that contribute to the challenge of finding the right people. Finding good SREs and finding people that can operate at this level is a very big challenge. And then once you have them in the door, once you pass them through the funnel, convincing them to come work for you is also a big challenge. So we'll talk about both of those things. But first, I wanted to address some of the things that matter for building a great company. Right? You guys are here because you want your company to succeed. You want better performance. You want better everything. And one thing that I hear commonly is people want to have greatness. They want to be remembered. They want to have a legacy. Right, what are the things that matter for having a great company? Well, funding uh, is obviously important. If you don't have money, you can't keep the lights on, you can't keep the servers running, you're not going to operate very long. You have a good idea. Good ideas are a dime a dozen. They are nice to have, but a good idea alone is not going to make your company something that lasts. Execution, again, uh, if, we're looking, if we're picking on someone, say Webvan, had lots of funding, they had a great idea, they had great execution, and was still a dismal flop, right? So these things are not enough to build a company that lasts and to build a great company. Even having a unique product, being the first mover, all this kind of stuff, all of that is good, and I would argue probably all of it is necessary, but the thing that is really, really critical here are your people. The people that build the systems, the people that build the tools, those are who exercise your vision, and good people can make up for a lot of shortcomings on these other four things. If your funding you know, is a little low, people will sacrifice. People that believe in your goals, people will work for that. If your idea, people can help you build that. Execution, people will work long hours. People will put in the effort. People will think of new ways. So it's all about people. You've got to have a strategy to get people in the door that can't just be, 
well, you know, we just hire from places. Like, if somebody leaves Google, we'll call them and say, hey, come work for us. That's not a strategy, right? That's just sort of second chances. So I want to talk about our culture at LinkedIn and why I think it's successful and why it's easier for us to hire SREs than it might be for some other companies. Uh, talent is our first operating priority, and everyone is aware of this. Everyone believes in this. And we have a company all-hands meeting every two weeks. Every single employee in the company, our executive staff, all the senior management, all those folks come to these. And at the first one of those, every single one, the first thing that's on the agenda is let's talk about talent. So it's a corporate culture element that is embedded in everyone's mind at LinkedIn. Talent's number one. You have to care about your talent. You have to care about your people. And this commitment is emphasized in how we behave. Every single person on the SRE team, no matter how long you've been here, no matter what team you work on, no matter what product you have, everyone is encouraged to do interviews. And I feel like the stat kind of speaks for itself in that 60% of our SREs participate in the process. And if you think about at your organization how many of your people are involved, if you're a large organization, you probably don't have everyone doing interviews. We try to push as many people as are comfortable to do them into doing them. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. The big one is it shows trust in the employee. You're saying very concretely, I trust you to find and define the future of this company. And it's a really powerful thing. And letting people know that you have that level of faith in them helps make them perform better. Right? The trust and the uh, level of expertise that you think they have is reflected in how they behave and how they perform. Before you can start to screen people, before you can try to find somebody, you have to know what it is that you want. Right? And you can't do an interview process very well if you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we wanted three things from our SREs. The first one is that we want them to be excited about LinkedIn. We want them to be excited about being an SRE. There are lots of roles at LinkedIn. If SRE is not the right one for you, we can refer you to something else. Uh, there are lots of companies. And if you're not the right fit for LinkedIn, we would like for you to go to one of those companies instead. Uh, we have the luxury of being picky. We get lots of applicants for a small number of openings. So it's easy for us to say, and, you know, we don't really think you're in it, right? We don't think you have the commitment to LinkedIn. We don't think you're excited about it. Um, and that is the first thing on the list because it's the most important one. It's one of the things that you can't really train. You can't really come get later <laughs> if you go into the job. If you're in your interview on your best behavior and you're kind of like, eh, it's a job, then that's the kind of person you don't want, right? You want somebody that's passionate about what you're doing and what you're building. These are the people who you are handing over the keys of the kingdom to. You want to make sure that you can trust them in their judgment. Next is that we want people who fit our culture and embody our values. And these are really, really important. And if you were here for the tutorials yesterday, you can remember a quote from one of the morning sessions, which was, a company's culture isn't about stuff that's on the wall or coffee mugs or anything like that. It's not about what the company says. It's about what the company does. It's based on who gets hired, who gets promoted, who gets fired. Right? So having those things and watching how your company behaves is a way that you can express your culture. You should be able to ask any LinkedIn employee, and I could call one of them up and put them on the spot. I'm not going to because I'm nice. Of how the culture operates at LinkedIn. Who gets promoted? Who gets hired? What are the things that, we, that set us apart? And you want people that, when you bring them into the organization, feel the same way and feel like they would make those same decisions that you make. And then finally, and up here last, is that they have the skills needed to do the job. Needed is in bold and underlined because really that's all you should be caring about. If the skill is not necessary, if it's just it would be nice if they knew this, you shouldn't be screening for it under your interview process. You also need to know what these are before you can hire someone. So if you just say, oh, we need another DevOps guy. Oh, let's just have these people interview somebody. Well, what do you expect you're going to get out of that process? If you don't know what you're looking for, you will not know when you have found it. So you need to be able to articulate what the skills are that are necessary to do the job. In industrial psychology land, we call that a job analysis. It's outside the scope of this talk, but I recommend you Google that term if you haven't done so already. An important thing that's not up here, so you'll notice we say, and nothing else. This is it. These are the things we want. Things that are not up here are somebody you want to hang out with on the weekend or somebody you'd be happy to run into outside of work or somebody who won a programming contest or went to a really elite school or any of that stuff. None of that matters. Right? What matters is can they do the job as you have defined it? That is what you should be screening for. If you are screening for something else, you are throwing away lots of good candidates because you're focusing on something that isn't relevant to your job. So this is my favorite slide because this is where I get to tell everyone that you're doing it wrong. And there are lots of things that people do as hiring practices that are suboptimal. And one of the big ones is coding puzzles. People love giving coding puzzles. And for SREs, Realistically, 
does that really matter if they can find some interesting solution to this algorithm question you've given them? Is that something they're going to do ever on the job? You should really think about that before you find out that your whole screening method is, oh, well, we give them a couple of problems that they can look up in a book on Amazon, by the way, and we have them take them home and do them. Similar thing are Fermi problems, estimation problems. How many manhole covers are there in Manhattan? How many ping pong balls can you fit in a bus? Why would you ever ask that? What is the thing that you want your SRE to be able to do? And people will argue, oh, it's about capacity estimation. Great, if you want to know about capacity estimation, ask them about capacity estimation. Say, hey, we have a web service. It's a standard three-tier stack. How would you scale it to handle 1,000 QPS, 10,000 QPS, 100,000 QPS, a million QPS? You actually get data out of that. You can tell quite easily, this guy knows what he's talking about or this guy doesn't. If you just say how many ping pong balls fit in a bus, that doesn't show you that they know how scaling works or operability works. It shows you that they read a book on how to solve estimation problems. Again, algorithm design questions, especially for SREs, these are almost certainly not what you really want to be asking. Um, the, if your SREs are, writing, are spending time optimizing code, you've probably gone down the wrong path. Uh, we do have SREs code at LinkedIn. It is important. It's something that is part of our screening process and something we care about. But we screen by actually asking people to write code that they would use on the job, which I know is crazy. But it's code that would actually be relevant to work they will do as an SRE. Uh, you don't want to ask people things that aren't relevant. People don't like it, and it doesn't give you good data. Personality questions. Right? If you were a zebra, what pattern would your stripes have? What's your favorite color? You know, all, all this sort of stuff. What is the right answer to that? Can someone tell me what pattern a zebra stripe should be for an SRE? Like, is, that, is that really a thing? And this is a, le a, a legitimate question I got when I was interviewing for SRE jobs a while ago. Um, th these are actual questions people do ask. It's nonsense. There, there's no correct way to answer this. Homework is also very contentious. Lots of companies want homework. And the justification I hear for homework is, well, it shows that they're committed to the company. Great. What's your commitment to them? Somebody reaches out to you and your first response is, here's a five-hour long homework assignment. That's not really starting off on a good foot, is it? Um, if you have people that are desperate enough to work for you that they'll fill out a homework assignment, great. But one thing that you should be aware of is about 90 plus percent of people who self-identified as top developers in a CIO magazine survey said they would not even consider doing homework assignments. So if you're okay with throwing away 90% of the market, knock yourself out, ask homework questions. Uh, if not, I would recommend that you don't do this. Personality tests are recommended sometimes in the industrial psych literature, which is unfortunate because in technology they are pretty bad. Um, again, the data you're going to get from a personality test is not going to be relevant to performance as an SRE. You really want to think about, as an SRE, what are, the, what are the essential skills for this job? And then you want to design your interview system to get at just those things. Last thing, trivia. Does anyone know the answer to this question? What is signal 7 in RHEL 6.4 on x86? And if you're Googling, that's cheating. Anyone else? Oh, nobody in this room could be an SRE at LinkedIn? There's such a talent shortage. Why can nobody answer our simple question? Every day I need to know about signals. Why does nobody know about these? This question is bullshit. Right? If you need to know what signal number seven is, you can look it up and you can figure out what it is. It's also kind of a trick question because it's different on different architectures. So Sigbu it's Sigbus, by the way, um, is signal seven on x86. Uh, signal 10 is Sigbus on all of the other architectures RHEL 6.4 supports. Uh, so don't ask trivia questions. They're just, the, the level of knowledge you are assessing is the most fundamental, most elementary sort of thing. And it doesn't get into the analytics, the decision making. The real reason why you hire SREs and pay them what you pay them is not because they're good at memorizing things. You do that because of their decision making skills and the fact that you feel confident delegating your entire business into these people. So why do these not work? Well, there are two guys named Schmidt and Hunter uh, that wrote a paper in 1998 that has this really, really long title that I suggest you go read. There are copies of it online everywhere. If you find a paywall one, just keep looking. They're all over the place. Um, and they have summarized almost 100 years worth of research into what makes people effective at work. What are things that predict performance? And I'll give you a hint. All the stuff on that last slide is not in this paper because they don't predict performance well. But even if you haven't found this out, even if industrial psychologists like Schmidt and Hunter and other contemporary people haven't figured this out, you should have your own data. If you're hiring people and you just go, yeah, I'm sure this guy worked out, you are doing yourself a huge disservice. You need to be able to track over the long run, what are things that predict actual performance? What modules do we give that actually correlate to somebody being a good fit for this job or not? If you're not doing that, 
you're probably just following a hunch or a Cairo cult. Right? Everybody else is doing homework, so we'll do homework. Oh, now everybody else is doing algorithm problems, so we'll do algorithm problems. You need to decide what works at your organization. You guys don't all work for LinkedIn, only these people in the front row do. So you will all have something else that you're trying to focus on and that you need to hire for. You need to know what that is. Uh, on the speaker notes for this slide, so you can go download these now, I guess, whenever they're available, uh, I have a bunch of additional reading that I highly suggest you check out if any of this is interesting to you. Uh, one of the big things is the Hawthorne Works uh, studies. Does anyone other than you know what those are? So the Hawthorne Works study, basically, uh, if you Google for Hawthorne effect, it will be interesting reading. Uh, the summary is that things that you monitor change just on the basis that you are monitoring them. And it's incredibly powerful to think about when you're designing an interviewing system, what are you actually looking for, and how does that impact people's actual performance? So we talked about what doesn't work, and I got to say all of you are doing it wrong. And now we need to talk about what does. The most important component is having a good funnel. You want to be able to filter the people so that you're not interviewing people who are a waste of time. Right? If they can't meet the requirements of the job, if you know they're not going to make it, don't waste anybody's time interviewing them. You're wasting the candidate's time, you're wasting your people's time, you're wasting management time. It's just all a bad thing all the way around. So you want to have a good funnel at the beginning. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the funnel in too much detail, but if you want to learn more about it, come to office hours. I'll be happy to talk about it then. The three things that do work for these kind of jobs are realistic job previews, structured interviews, and situational judgment tests. These are the things that you should be doing. You should be doing them for any sort of DevOps role. The reason is twofold. One is that they have really high standalone validity. That means if I give you a realistic job preview, it's going to do a good job of predicting how you'll perform on the job. That's a good thing to have. These three things together also have good incremental validity. So if I give you a realistic job preview and a structured interview, I get more predictive power than if I had just given you one of them. And then the last part is that they also have good face validity, so they look good to the candidate. Right? Let's say I could develop some sort of machine that you would put your hand in, and it would read your lifeline, and if you didn't have one, it would say, great, you can be an SRE. We know you're going to be a good fit for this job, and we can predict with 100% certainty that you will, be, you will excel as an SRE if your hand has this pattern. Nobody would go for that, right? That has poor face validity. It looks bad. These things look good. They are exciting to the candidates. They give them a preview of what it's like to be at your company. They give them a chance to feel like they're part of the team for that time you have them on, ha on hand. So these are the things you should be doing, these three things. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do those just in a couple of seconds. So I will briefly talk about the funnel. The first thing, of course, is sourcing and screening. You need to find candidates. You need to have the recruiter ideally do some degree of bozo filtering. If the person has never heard of Linux, then you probably don't want to waste your time talking to them. Uh, and then you have a, we have two phone screens at LinkedIn. We have an operationally focused phone screen, which asks you questions about how to operate a website at large scale, how the internet works, how to do monitoring, sort of the fundamentals of operat operability. And then we have a coding focused phone screen. So we use CollabEdit. It's a dual editor, so you can type and I can watch you type. And we have people do coding exercises that you would do on the job or that are similar to ones you do on the job. The takeaway from this is that by the time somebody comes on site, we expect that they will pass. Bringing someone on site who you think is going to fail is a huge waste of time. And bringing somebody on site that you're taking a chance on, unless you're really, really desperate, you probably shouldn't be doing that. You want to bring people on site that you predict very well will probably pass. Because again, there's such a huge time investment involved with doing this. So about 82% of our candidates pass our recruiter pre-screen, which sounds like, oh, it's not a good filtering step. 80% of people pass it. No. 20% of people fail it, and having those people eliminated saves us countless amounts of time down the road. People can easily BS their way through interviews. So having the pre-screen that is uh, the only trivia we ask at LinkedIn is in the recruiter pre-screen. Uh, and having that sort of trivia there does really help you eliminate people that aren't qualified and that you know aren't going to make it. And then we have about 25% of people pass both phone screens. Uh, the way that our data is stored in the system, I can't break that down into you know, uh, each level. But again, about 25% pass both phone screens. So we funnel down significantly the amount of people who come in the door and how many people we actually end up bringing on site. Yes, it is 24% of the 82. So I mentioned three things that you should be doing. Realistic job previews, structured interviews, and situational judgment tests. And now I'm going to talk about what those are. Right? So a realistic job preview is exactly what it sounds like. I can't really describe it any more clearly than this. You give someone a realistic preview of what they would do on the job. You show them how they would operate on a day-to-day -day basis. 
It gives them a chance to put themselves in the shoes of an SRE. It gives them an opportunity to figure out if they really like doing what you're going to have them do or not. Structured interviews, again, they are exactly what they sound like. It is an interview that has structure. And in this case, structure is a consistent set of questions and a consistent set of scoring. One of the things that is very important when you're doing an interview process is that you can compare different interviewers. If you just say, we have five people interview everybody, and they can never agree on anything, it's like, well, because you're not all asking the same questions. How do you expect them to agree? Right? They have different insights on the person. So you want to be able to, res to reliably, every time that you give somebody this module, you know the questions they're going to be asked, you know what the answer should be, and you can compare those across interviewers. And finally, you can see where we're going with this. Situational judgment tests, also exactly what they sound like. Right? You, at, you put someone in a situation, and you ask them to express or to pass judgment on what they would do. Now, these are incredibly important for SREs. This is probably the most important part of the hiring process. As SREs, we have keys to the kingdom. Right? Most orgs, you have root on every single box as an SRE. You have to think of that as an enormous amount of power that one person has. You want to make sure that people are willing to wield it correctly. You want to see their judgment. You want to know what people would do in a situation that could happen on the job. And you want people that will exercise judgment the same way that you would, or at least in a way that you think is fair or reasonable. If somebody is troubleshooting a problem and their first solution is, well, let's reboot everything, that probably isn't going to be OK. I mean, maybe in some places it is, but it certainly wouldn't be here. So one of the things that is a huge qualification for being an SRE is that we can trust you and that we can trust your judgment. The only way you can figure that out before you hire them is to give someone a situational judgment test. If you were just throwing them into the org and you find out later on that they could not be trusted, well, you've made a gigantic mistake and you've spent a lot of money, a lot of time. You've maybe impacted somebody's life pretty heavily by saying, oh, here's a great job. Oh, you screwed it up two months later? Well, now you have to quit. So ask people beforehand. <laughs> give situational judgment tests. And we'll talk about how to do all of these shortly. So we have four modules for an on-site interview at LinkedIn. They are live troubleshooting, which is a realistic job preview, systems internals and web architecture, which are structured interviews, and triage and investigation, which are situational judgment tasks. We also have people meet with the manager for an hour, sort of tell us about your hopes and dreams, why are you excited about LinkedIn, what's your five-year plan, that kind of thing. And then we have lunch, which is not an interview technically, um, but as I'm sure you are all aware, you do learn a lot of data from having somebody in a social setting, and in one where they feel like they can relax a little bit. You're sort of convincing them to let their guard down, which may be a mistake, but uh, you do get to see how candidates behave, and it's valuable data to take the candidate out to lunch. If you're not doing that, you should, especially if you're giving them five modules, because it's kind of rude to bring somebody in for five hours and not feed them. So also take them out to lunch if you're spending a long time. So first thing is live troubleshooting. I love the live troubleshooting module, and there's a lot of reasons. The biggest one is, again, it's a realistic preview of what the job will be. So we have the candidate come in, we hand them a laptop. The laptop is connected to an EC2 instance that's running a service that is broken. And the instructions are, fix it. So you have to think about this. If you're on call at a place like LinkedIn with 300 services, the odds that somebody is going to call you about the one service that you have learned last week is pretty low, right? You're probably going to get called about something else. So you're going to have to figure out on the fly, how do I know about this service? How do I find the documentation? How do I troubleshoot what's gone wrong? This is as real as it gets. Right? This is, if you were on call, this is exactly what would happen to you. You can't man Voldemort. Right? There's no man page for all of the internal stuff at LinkedIn. There's documentation, sure. Uh, but problems with documentation are well known. I'm not going to bash those. But the, the real takeaway from this stuff is that when you're troubleshooting an on-call issue at LinkedIn, you are quite probably the first person in the world that has ever come across this exact problem. And you can't exactly go on Stack Overflow and say, I can't make Voldemort talk to Kafka help, because half of those words make no sense to anybody in this room that doesn't work on LinkedIn. So you have to be able to fault solve these problems on your own. And that is what the Live Troubleshooting module is. It's a very high fidelity simulation, because it's actually a broken service, of how to fix this. And so there are, uh, the service, by the way, is a modified Apache. Um, it's very mean. So if you want more details into how we made it mean, come to office hours, and I will share them with you. Uh, generally speaking, though, you don't want to have the candidate work on something that's an actual production service at your company. You do want to give them something that is uh, a high-fidelity simulation of a production service. So we have a lot of front ends, so we use an Apache-based kind of thing. Our structured interview modules are, like I said, structured. They have a set of questions that we ask everyone. 
We have scoring guidelines so that if they say this, they get this score, so that we can compare across interviewers. All of these folks, I can say, I know that they're going to give the same candidate roughly the same score. And that way, you can just assign interviewers willy-nilly. You don't have to go, oh, the guy that knows this module isn't here today, because you shouldn't have to restrict yourself like that. So scoring guidelines are what matter here. You have to have consistent scoring guidelines so that if you had two people give the same person the module, they would give you the same score. If you don't have that, you can't ever do correlations or comparisons with the data. Later on, that's going to be the thrust of the talk, is you have to collect data and you have to use the data or else you are passing up on a huge opportunity. So triage and investigation is uh, another one of my favorite modules because uh, we start off with situational judgment. Right? So we say basically, hey, it's your first day, and the knock calls you and says, hey, the site's on fire, help. And you go and you look at the alert board, and there are 10 things that we give you as an alert board. Which one do you look at first, and why? Now, this does tell you a lot about the person. The big thing is sort of just, what do they prioritize? When exercising their judgment into looking at things, what is the thing they look at? You also get data if they look at you and say, well, there's four things that are broken. <laughs> yeah, well, in the real world, things normally don't break one thing at a time, right? You have cascading failures. So you want to be able to assess what the candidate prioritizes. What does the candidate think is important? Are those things you think is important? They probably should be. Yeah. We also have some standard troubleshooting investigation kind of questions. So things like the CEO calls you and says the site is slow and then hangs up. What do you start to look at? How do you triage that? How do you verify that that's an accurate problem? You know, is it everybody or just him? That kind of thing. And then we have things like this. The disk is full. You deleted the file, but then you run DF, and hey, the disk is still full. What do you do? What's wrong? And there are lots of answers to this question, including restart the box, which, yep, that would fix it, but you maybe should investigate whether that's a good thing to do or not. There's restart the service, which, again, would probably fix it, but, again, you don't know if that's a good idea or not. So you are asking people in all these situations, situations, to exercise their judgment on how they would solve these problems. These are things that give you a window into how people troubleshoot. You have to know this stuff. If you're hiring for S3s, if you're hiring for star ops, you have to know how they're going to troubleshoot, because that's a huge part of our job. Carrying around that pager ball and chain is what we live to do, and so you want to make sure that people can actually do that well. So we implemented these changes about seven months ago, and we have had much, much happier candidates. We've had no negative candidate feedback from our new interview process. None. Zero. And given the fact that the new interview process is kind of hard, the live troubleshooting module especially, uh, that's surprising. But if you look at these quotes, troubleshooting module was the most fun I've ever had, and then the troubleshooting module was hard, but I learned a lot. And these things aren't necessarily contradictory. right? The sweet spot for us in SRE hiring is someone who does find this module hard, but goes, it was hard, and I loved that it was hard. Because working on the stack at LinkedIn is not easy. Right? There are things that are very complicated. There's cruft. There's stuff that it, we don't really understand how to troubleshoot very well. But if you liked doing it in the interview, you're going to like doing it on the job. So we like having this kind of feedback. Our interviewers are also happier because they're getting better data, and they can figure out more effectively how the person fits in and if, how their specific contribution matters to the overall interview process. Now, there was a little bit of hesitation at first, uh, especially around the live troubleshooting module. If you think about this from the interviewer perspective, it's super stressful to sit there with some candidate who could do God knows what to your service, and you're still expected to be able to help them get to the right answer. Right? So if the first troubleshooting step they do is go in and wipe the box, well, you have to be able to deal with that. So uh, there was some hesitation among the interviewers, but we solved that with aggressive training. We have lots of training sessions people can come to, and they can learn about how to do this. And we implemented optional apprenticeships. So if you're feeling a little less than confident about how to give live troubleshooting, that's cool. We'll let you shadow somebody. We'll let you learn how to do it. And we can do that with any of the modules. An important thing that's not on the slide but that is super, super critical to me is to mention that even for candidates that we don't hire, we still want them to have a good experience. And there's two reasons for that. One is that they might have a smart friend. And if they do, we want them to come, offer them to come work at LinkedIn. But the other one is that we want to act according to our culture. And putting members first and acting in the best interest of everyone are things that are essential to our culture. We want people to feel like they had a good experience, even if they bombed it. There's no point in being a jerk. You don't gain anything by decimating somebody and making them feel bad. What does that get you? Nothing. You still didn't hire them. You still have to find somebody else. So make people feel like they did a good job. Even if you're not going to make them the offer, you know, it doesn't hurt anything to be nice. And it's something that really helps your uh, reputation as a brand, as a hiring brand, uh, to get people out there and get people interested to come work for you. 
So the other thing, you have to collect data. Uh -huh. We collect a numeric score from each module that we deliver, and we have a numeric performance rating system. So obviously, at the end of the year, when our perf cycle comes around, we will correlate those numbers and be able to say, hey, these modules are correlated to performance this much. If a module does not predict performance, stop giving it. Right? If you have some sort of coding screen, and it turns out that that is not correlated with performance, stop giving a coding screen, because you're wasting time. Right? If you feel like a coding screen is necessary, then you need to change your coding screen to reflect what people will actually do on the job, or at least the components of it that will matter for job performance. If there's no correlation between your interview module and actual performance, it is a worthless module. You are wasting everyone's time. So please, if you take away nothing else, take away, collect data, and build correlations. If you want help knowing how to do that, come talk to me in office hours. I'd be happy to share how we're doing it. Next year, I'll plan on sharing actual data with you about what we did. Um, but collect the data. It's very, very helpful. And then finally, there's sort of takeaways here of how do you make your process better? How do you make hiring less hard for you? Make talent your first priority. Tell your team, we care about filling these positions. It's the most important thing that we do is picking other people to work on this product, picking other people to work with us. Implement good things from IO psychology, realistic job previews, situational judgment tests, structured interviews, change your interviews to structured. Again, if you do nothing else, change your interviews to have some structure. Please do not just have a list of questions on the wiki that people can just randomly choose from. Again, you're basically, you may as well throw darts. Like, you're not actually predicting performance at that point. You're just predicting who had a good day and who got the right questions. And there's way too many compounding variables if you don't have structure in your interviews. Collect data on your interview performance. You want to know how people are performing. You can't just say yes or no. You want to have some granularity so that you can make those correlations later on, so that you can evaluate performance later on. Leave the conference and invest in your interview process. Look at what you are doing. Look at how you're screening people. Look at the modules you're giving. Figure out if this actually matters for your job and for your role. If you are asking people to do things that don't predict performance and that aren't related to what they're doing, you are asking people the wrong stuff, and you are wasting huge amounts of time. So I do have to give you the obligatory plug here. Like every other company at Velocity, LinkedIn is hiring. If you want to experience this yourself, that would be great. We would love to have you do that. Come see me afterwards, or come by booth 907, or look for someone wearing this shirt. Uh, all of us can guide you to the right people. I have office hours at 2 o'clock. Anything that is related to hiring, culture, any of that stuff is completely fair game. I would love to talk to all of you. Uh, and then finally, please, like uh, John has said all morning, please give feedback on the app or the website. I do want very much to hear what you liked, what you didn't like, all that sort of thing. Uh, please do let me know. It is 11.58. We'll probably be the first people to lunch. Thank you all for your attention. Please feel free to come by office hours.